you may have played any or all of the excellent series of Baldur's Gate video games. Perhaps you've read the books, adventured within its walls through pen and paper, or listened to the story recaps in preparation for the game's most recent installment. But there are stories still left untold, and much left to be discovered. The story and lore of BioWare's first and groundbreaking CRPG, Baldur's Gate, told in long form and as never before, right now on Riches and Liches. Welcome adventurers, scholars, and world builders. I'm Rich and this is Riches and Liches, dedicated to dungeons, dragons, and tales of lore. If you've made it this far, then you most likely have at least a passing interest in the rich lore of the Sword Coast, specifically the tales surrounding the great port city of Baldur's Gate, as I do, perhaps even reignited by the release of Larian Studios' most exceptional Baldur's Gate 3. Whether you are playing through the entire series, looking to get caught up on the complete lore, or just love a good story, I think you'll really enjoy today's offering. While Baldur's Gate existed long before the video game series, being part of Ed Greenwood's own Forgotten Realm setting created before man even landed upon the moon, Circa 1967, and officially becoming part of the Dungeons & Dragons lore in the 80s. It was Bioware's original story, however, in Baldur's Gate 1 that really put the city and its lore on the map. In fact, the series was so well received and proved so popular that many aspects of those stories have since been codified as canonical Dungeons & Dragons lore. And while lots of summaries and recaps of the game's lore exist in both long and short form, I really wanted to write and share a compelling story, one that mirrors my own and likely millions of my fellow RPG enthusiasts' experiences with this legendary series. However, as much as I enjoyed the story in Baldur's Gate 1, Transcribing a variable and semi-personal story, one with lots of choices and twisting paths, all created in a video game environment, it did leave a lot of headroom to weave a tale of my own artistic license. Now, for those that are looking for only a canonical recap of the main storyline and maybe some extended lore, worry not, I've got you covered. I'll also be creating a shorter video devoid of any of the story elements, so please feel free to check that out if that's of interest. And if this volume proves popular, I plan to also cover the expansions, the sequels, and even some deep lore dives into some of the more notable characters. So if you enjoy a good story and want to hear and see the Baldur's Gate tale like never before, then settle in and let me regale you with the dark story of the series' first central protagonist. You know him best as you if you played the game, but the historical canon knows him as Abdel Adrian, Ward of Candlekeep. Abdel was born sometime between 1347 and 1348 DR, or Dale Reckoning. As a young child, Abdel was taken in by an accomplished mage named Gorion and raised in the Sword Coast Library Fortress of Faerun, Candlekeep. The young boy grew up alongside his childhood friend, Emowyn another orphan taken in and raised by the inn's keeper, Winthrop. As children, Abdel and Emowyn formed an unshakable bond, becoming as close as siblings. Together, they would find all manner of mischief around Candlekeep's ancient halls and secret passages, constantly vexing the Keep's monks and watchers with their excited and curious expeditions. Yet, Gorion's wisdom and kindness always kept Abdel on the righteous path, under Gorion's tutelage, Abdel received a proper education from Candlekeep's scholars. He studied history, philosophy, magic, and more. Gorion also ensured he was trained well in arms and combat, for the roads outside the keep could be dangerous. Despite the Gate Warden Hull's gruff demeanor, he took his training duties seriously, putting the children through rigorous weapon drills. Emowyn favored the bow, while Abdel excelled early with sword and shield. As Abdel grew from a child into manhood, he sensed he was different than the other children. His reflexes and strength vastly exceeded the other wards, even those some years older. When sparring, he sometimes fell into an involuntary trance, effortlessly disarming his opponents, even humbling veteran guards on occasion. Yet through all his years raised in the Great Knowledge Fortress, his heritage remained a veiled history. 
Despite his constant inquiries, Karain refused to explain Abdel's unique gifts or his origin, but there was no doubt he cared for him like a son. Sheltered in the safety and magically warded Candlekeep, Abdel had few worries. He grew tall and strong in body and mind under Garayan's wise guidance. However, that serenity changed abruptly on the dawn of Abdel's 20th birthday in 1368 DR. Garayan suddenly burst into his quarters, saying they must depart Candlekeep immediately. Taken aback, Abdel began to object, but Garayan quickly cut him off. Son, there are things you do not understand, evils I have sheltered you from. I wish I had time to explain, but you have to trust me, and we must leave Candlekeep at once. Please, follow me, stay close and speak to no one. I will tell you more when we are beyond the Keep's walls. Strange tidings weighed heavily in the air, and there was no time for delay. Gathering sparse provisions and weapons, Gorion and his ward Abdel departed through a little-used side passage long before the sun rose. Southward they traveled, mostly in silence, through the early morning night. Gorion answered no questions, eyes scanning the moonlit road warily. Abdel noted that Gorion was carrying the heavy burden of concern on his weary face. Abdel had never seen such worry on the normally thoughtful and measured mage. After two days of travel south, Gorion finally spoke of their hastily planned exit from the only home Abdel had ever known. The young ward was told that if danger arose, or if they were separated for any reason, he must flee south to the friendly arm inn and present a letter to Gorion's trusted allies, Khalid and Jahira. More he would not say, other than to warn Abdel not to return to Candlekeep or deviate from this directive. Unease gnawed at Abdel, both a mixture of fear, excitement, and worry, but he knew Gorion to have his best interest at heart and nodded in solemn agreement. As the sun hid behind the horizon on the evening of the second day, treachery fell upon them. A towering figure encased in spiked black plate armor emerged from the darkness to block their path. This ominous figure, flanked by a group of four shadowy silhouettes in black leather and wielding long daggers that glistened in the moonlight. Do not be a fool, Gorion. Hand over the child or perish with him. His time among the mortals is at an end. The righteous and just will never yield to your evil, Deathbringer. Gorion immediately turned and shouted for Abdel to flee into the forest. Abdel paused, wanting to stay and fight. But Gorion held upon him a grave look that gave Abdel chills, telling him there were dire omens unrealized. So, reluctantly, Abdel turned and ran, just as the clash of steel and magic rang out behind him. Two of the bladed assassins attempted to give chase, but were cut down by powerful magic from Gorion. Dashing at full speed through the underbrush, branches lashing his face, Abdel heard Gorion cry out spell after spell, while the armored figure roared in both pain and rage. Abdel knew his adoptive father as an accomplished mage in his own right, but he was also outnumbered. Abdel fought back the desire to turn back, tears not of fear but shame and loss now streaming in his eyes. Eventually the sounds of combat grew fainter and Abdel stumbled up a well-covered and forested hill. Reaching the top, Abdel turned just in time to see a blinding flash, like that of lightning, strike at the sight of the battle. Then all went deadly silent. Abdel hesitated a few moments, both taking in all that just occurred while contemplating his next move. The dark armored warrior indicated that he was the intended target, not Gorion. Knowing his life now in danger, Gorion would not want him returning to the scene, but he also knew he must. Slowly and silently, using every skill he had learned from his training, Abdel crept back towards the site of this abhorrent treachery. Abdel saw no sign of the hulking and ominous leader, but sadly did find Gorion lying dead in a pool of blood amidst the four corpses of flanked assassins. Gorion fell, but gave them his fury. Fighting back grief and more tears, Abdel felt a rage and inner strength well inside him. He swore to avenge this kind man who owed him nothing but raised and cared for him, the closest thing he had ever known to a real father. Abdel said his final goodbyes, and despite the obvious danger in sticking around, prepared to give his mentor a proper burial 
before continuing south as directed. Moments later, Abdel was startled by a leaping figure from behind a tree. His fear turned to relief as Abdel saw it was his friend Emmelin. What are you doing here? It's not safe. She explained in a mix of somber excitement and sadness that after their abrupt departure, she grew suspicious and decided to follow. She watched in horror as Gorion was struck down by the dark, armored evil and that she was determined to help Abdel on his journey. Despite Abdel's initial reluctance and insistence on her safety, Imowen refused to turn back, stating flatly, I will not abandon my closest friend in such a time of tragedy and danger. I will see that Gorion is avenged and ensure that you don't do anything stupid. Abdel had no argument and despite his concern for her, was glad he was not alone. He smiled and nodded in agreement. After burying the beloved Gorion and saying their prayers for his peaceful afterlife, together they would search for answers and retribution. Abdel quickly learned that on the road ahead, he would find many dangers. As they traveled south down the Coastway Road, not far from the walled hamlet known as the Friendly Arm, the young ward was suddenly struck with a blinding pain as a series of arcane missiles erupted from the hands of a black-robed mage who set upon them without a word. But Abdel would not flee from this fight. Wincing from the pain only momentarily, Abdel felt a strange surge of power and confidence rise from his very soul. And with the assistance of Imowen's bow and his own deftly wielded blade, they dispatched the would-be assassin. A check of the mage assassin's belongings quickly confirmed that there was indeed a price on Abdel's head as he read aloud the bounty notice. Be it known to those of evil intent that a bounty has been placed upon the head of Abdel Adrian, foster child of the sage Gorion. Last seen in the area of Candlekeep, this person is to be killed in quick order. Those returning with proof of the deed shall receive no less than 200 coins of gold. As always, any that reveal these plans to the forces of law shall join the target in their grim fate. Abdel also found several magical scrolls that might come in handy down the line. While Abdel was always fond of using a blade, Grant had taught him some basics in the arcane arts. Regardless, they would need to remain ever cautious moving forward. Arriving at the Friendly Arm Inn, Abdel and Emowen met Khalid and Jahira just as instructed, handing them the note Garayn had provided. The half-elf warrior and druid were saddened and sympathetic upon hearing of Gorion's demise, but could explain little of his reasons for the sudden flight from Candlekeep. However, they spoke very highly of Gorion, reminiscing over their shared ideals and time spent together as members of the Harpers, an organization dedicated to the balancing of nature and defending of the innocent from forces of evil all across Faerun. His was a terrible loss, and they too wanted answers. Having none at the moment, however, the pair suggested that Abdel and Emowen travel with them. They were headed to investigate the Nashkel iron mines on the northern slopes of the Cloud Peaks, where rumors of strange troubles brewed. The married half-elf couple explained that a grave iron crisis had spread across the realm, with ore shipments being hijacked all along the Sword Coast, and that a strange magic curse had been laid upon the iron exports of the Nashkel mines, rendering the ore brittle and useless. Further, the crisis had started to cause finger-pointing and saber-rattling among the rival city-states of Am and Baldur's Gate, each accusing the other of ill intent and threatening of war. Khalid and Jahira thought that perhaps clues to Garion's death might surface along the way, and besides, there would be safety in numbers as the half-elves promised to do all they could to protect both Abdel and Emowen. Accepting of their offer of companionship, this new four-person adventuring team set out on the road to Nashkel. The journey was long and fraught with perils, as yet another group of assassins attempted to waylay the group one evening as they camped. Again, Abdel surged with a mix of grief and rage that he could not place. Engaging the nefarious attackers, he fought with a level of skill that even surprised himself as he moved with a veteran's poise in battle. His sword sliced through foes as though guided by fate's hand. While he did not understand the well of might from which he drew such ferocity, he was glad to see it serve him well, 
protecting Imowen and his new friends. As the party arrived in Nashkel, it became clear something malign had befallen the iron mine. The mayor, a man named Baron Gaskill, spoke of workers gone missing, then turning up torn limb from limb, and what little ore extracted being cursed or tainted. The mayor even offered a reward to the young adventurers should they wish to investigate the mines. Accepting, the group of four took to the task of descending the dark tunnels to investigate whatever villainy was responsible for such wickedness. It did not take long before they uncovered the source of malice, packs of kobolds sabotaging the mine door with some dark alchemy and slaughtering miners with impunity, but to what end was not yet clear. Steel rang and spells blazed as the young would-be heroes clashed with the savage humanoids in the cramped and malodorous tunnels of this deep mine. The kobolds fought in packs like cornered rats, outnumbering the group, but Abdel fighting side by side with Khalid carved through the vile vermin with uncanny grace, while Emowyn showed steady aim with arrow strikes and the timely disarming of traps. Meanwhile, Jahira proved quite adept with her staff, and her druidic magic healed any wounds the party suffered. Mowing through the waves of kobolds, they at last had reached a cave entrance at the base of the mine some four levels below the surface. Stepping into the rocky chamber, the party meets the foul Mullahay. The half-orc cleric quickly addressed the group in a tone dripping of paranoia and initially misunderstanding the group's purpose here. Did that fat, arrogant ogre Tezok dispatch you here for my head while my traitorous kobolds just let you pass? This is completely unnecessary. By Cyric, I tell you, not a measure of ore leaves these mines unspoiled, as brittle as an old wizard's bones. And yet you are here to execute me? The cleric points to a chest and informs the party that the documentation will prove he has done as ordered. The perplexed look on the group's face as they begin discussing their next move in dealing with this situation must have revealed the mistaken identification as the cleric quickly summoned six skeletons into his service. The summoned minions did as instructed, but in mere minutes it was clear to Mullahay that he had no chance against Abdel's trance-like onslaught and the skill of his comrades. As the final skeleton crumbled into a pile of bones, Mullahay attempted to plead for his repugnant life, but no more than three words escaped his lips before the half-orc's head was hewn from his shoulders with a single clean stroke from Abdel's blade. The ferocious haze that consumed Abdel in battle was both impressive and ominous. Searching Mullahay's chamber and belongings, the group finds several items to assist them in their journeys that lie ahead, including an honorary ring of Soon for Jahira and some improved armor for Khalid. Additionally, they found an impious unholy symbol revealing Molahe was an evil acolyte of Cyric, the god of lies, trickery, and deceit, and most importantly, found several documents. Among them, proof the cleric was in the employ of a shady mercenary company called the Black Talons, run by an ogre bandit lord named Tazok. While the notes failed to mention the location of Tazok, they do tell of Molahe's handler through which all communication is handled, a mage named Transig, who was staying in Baragost at the Feldpost Inn. Leaving the mine on their way to Baragost to find this Transig, the party stops to inform the mayor that Mullahay has been eliminated, and the remaining kobolds have fled or been vanquished, handing Baron the cleric's unholy symbol as proof. The mayor and the town are very appreciative, hailing the party as heroic. The mayor hands the party a reward of 900 gold coins as word spreads of this fledgling heroic group. Their encounter with the cowardly mage Transig and Baragos proved uneventful but useful enough as the party learns that Hazok's mercenary company is located in a bandit camp deep in the wood of the Sharp Teeth and that Tazak's tent will be the one that is clearly the largest. More dark powers at work behind the scenes but still more questions remain. Venturing deep into the vast and expansive forest for several hours, the group finally locates the sprawling bandit camp just before sunset and identifies the large tent Transig indicated would be Tazak's. With their recent victorious battles and improved gear, the group embodies a growing confidence in their ability to fight any villainy across the realm. With no delay, Abdel leads the group forward in the twilight of dusk 
his blade cutting down the only two guards that noticed their otherwise silent approach. Their timing, however, was anything but fortunate as they entered the large, dimly lit mercenary tent. The flickering torches cast eerie shadows across the faces of five menacing bandit leaders, all seated within, as well as an imprisoned elven male in a large cage near the rear of the tent. The group's presence immediately drew the attention of this malevolent group. Knowing stealth was not an option, Abdel wasted no time in pointing at the massive ogre he presumed to be the bandit lord Tazak. Are you Tazak? Abdel demanded with unwavering confidence. Grinning, the massive ogre nodded slowly his affirmation as he stood, drawing forth a massive two-handed sword with a bone-chilling scrape. He glanced at his henchman, then back at Abdel. Well, well, would you look at that, boys? Who needs to offer a bounty when the target will just come right to your front door? <laughs> I took you for a bit of a coward, to be honest, but maybe you're stupid too. <laughs> Either way, your death saves me a bit of coin. Bring me his head, boys! The bandits rose quickly to meet the interlopers, weapons drawn as they advanced upon the party. Khalid quickly moved to engage Raymond, the Black Talon mercenary, in fierce one-on-one -on -one combat, displaying his courage and an improving self-confidence. Imowen moved roguelike to position herself strategically and skillfully, using the environment to her advantage as she drew her bow to rain arrows upon the mage known as Vinkt in an attempt to distract his spell casting from a distance. Even the imprisoned elf tried to assist, mocking Vinkt and throwing small stones from inside his cage, paying for his audacity as the mage enveloped him in an array of foul green energy, choking the elf. Nonetheless, the distraction proved costly as Emowyn landed an arrow deep into the mage's turned back, mortally wounding and dropping the enemy to the floor. Jahira chanted ancient incantations, summoning the power of nature to cast spells upon a gruesome knoll by the name of Britic, while also healing her friends as needed. Abdel charged into the hobgoblin known as Hacked, attempting to close the distance before the elite mercenary could fire arrows upon Jahira or Emowyn from a truly savage-looking bow, glowing of some powerful arcane magics. As the battle intensified, Abdel entered his mysterious trans-like state once again, with supernatural levels of agility, battle prowess, and combat tactics, he became a whirlwind of death upon his enemies. Hacked was the first to fall, and it was clear that the tides of battle were in their favor. Tazak, the massive ogre bandit lord, roared in frustration and perhaps surprise as he saw his henchmen begin to fall, overwhelmed by the group's combat skills and timely magic. Still, the overconfident ogre charged at Abdel with a wide arc of his great sword, aiming to deliver a limb-severing blow. However, Abdel's speed and finesse were unmatched. He dodged, parried, and countered with precision, frustrating Tazok's every powerful move. As the last of Tazok's henchmen fell and the numbers against the remaining but still deadly ogre quickly turned into four on one, the party seized the upper hand. Tazok was a mighty ogre lord that none present could expect to defeat alone, but the culmination of Abdel and Khalid's cutting strikes, Jahira's spells, and Emowyn's arrows were quickly wearing down the massive ogre, despite his heavy-plated protection and magical armaments. As this realization fell upon Tazak that he might actually be in grave danger of his own death, the bandit lord began looking for an escape route. Pulling a ring from his pocket and placing it upon his finger, the towering ogre instantly vanished from sight, leaving Abdel and his friends bewildered. Abdel tried to charge his last known position but all he found was empty air. Moments later, a crash, clamor, and a deep laugh reverberated as a massive ogre-sized tear appeared at the back of the tent as the unseen Tazak retreated from the fight, invisible and into the now nighttime air. As the fight ended and Abdel emerged from his combat trance, he had an unsettling feeling, as if a presence had taken notice of his actions, watching though he knew not the origin. As the adrenaline of battle began to subside, the companions take notice of the imprisoned elven male still suffering from the effects of a poisonous ray cast upon him. 
Emmeline explained how he had assisted her as Jahira healed his sickness. The elf introduced himself as Ender Sai, a self-proclaimed spy who, like Abdel and his friends, had been investigating the Iron Crisis and had tracked clues to this bandit camp before being captured by Tazok. Ender thanked the group for freeing him and informed the party that Tazok had stolen and used his own possession, a sand thief's ring, to turn invisible and make his escape. He suspects that the bandit lord would be headed to the Cloakwood Forest, where it was rumored a hidden mine exists that likely held vast quantities of the stolen and untainted iron ore causing the realm crisis. In addition, Inda revealed a well-hidden secret compartment belonging to Tazok, quickly warning that it was likely trapped. Emmeline, an aspiring thief and becoming quite handy at disarming traps, had no trouble with Tazok's secret stash. Inside, they found more magically imbued treasure to further empower their fortunes, including gauntlets of mastery for Abdel, a magic shield and sword for Khalid, and several potions and scrolls to further their magical abilities, as now three of the four comrades had access to arcane spells that would certainly come in handy. Khalid, however, preferred leaving the magic to his wife Jahira. Emmeline took a fancy to the deadly-looking bow that the elite Hobgoblin had held, later confirming it to be a most powerful bow of marksmanship. Once again, they also found documents critical to this unfolding mystery, confirming that the mercenaries were in the employ of a shady merchant organization known as the Iron Throne, with obscure references to someone named Saravok. The notes also confirmed that Tazak was taking orders from a mage named Daveorn, who runs the Cloakwood Mine. The elven spy Ender retrieved his own gear, again thanked the party for rescuing him, wished them well, and departed with a bow. With this newfound information and gear, this once nascent group of would-be heroes were not only gaining confidence and new skills and abilities, but the realm was taking notice. They were getting closer to the source of this villainy as they continued to follow the breadcrumbs, now taking them deep into the heart of the Cloakwood Forest. As they traveled, Abdel looked in contemplation among his friends, realizing now more than ever they had both a destiny and an obligation. Making their way into the Cloakwood Forest two days later, the group is approached by a well-armed band as they make camp. Not assassins per se, instead an arrogant lot consisting of two fighters and two mages led by a man named Drassus, likely tipped off by the retreating Tazak, but also confirming they must be moving in the right direction to find this hidden mine. Each group draws their weapons as Drassus, a human fighter wielding a shiny blade, addresses the group as his own comrades spread out preparing for combat. I see the tales of your renown have not been exaggerated. Word travels fast when aspiring heroes begin to cast shadows long enough to catch the eye of the underworld, leaving bodies in their wake. I told Tazak those fools chasing the bounty on your head were mere rabble, so the company hired professionals to get the job done. We are those professionals, the great tempest that follows the calm, the elite among scavengers. You may have carved a name for yourselves in whispers, but we are here to silence you forever. Prepare yourself, Ward of Gorion, for your journey reaches its twilight. Abdel, now emerging as the de facto leader of this group of heroes, steps forward with an air of confidence as his comrades make their own preparations. Yes, another group that tell us they are the Great Ones. I have simply lost count of how many elite mercenaries, assassins, and bandits have said the same thing to us, right before meeting their own unfortunate end. Maybe it's some rite of passage in this underworld of yours. Underestimating us seems to be a recurring and fatal error. But hey, if you're aiming to be another cautionary tale, who am I to stop you? And my name is Abdel Adrian, a name you would not soon forget were you to live past this night. Despite Abdel's confident retort, the clash between Abdel's heroic group and the formidable band was a true challenge of the group's growing abilities. Drassus, the band's confident and skilled leader, led his well-armed men into battle with unwavering determination. The battlefield was a chaotic frenzy of spells, steel, and strategy. Drassus, adorned in steel chainmail and boots of speed, was able to match Abdel's own alacrity as he barked combat orders to his henchmen. 
Emmeline, with her nimble fingers and keen eye, took aim at the mage Kaisis with her new bow, sending an arrow flying true. The arrow found its mark, but not before a fireball erupted, knocking both Jahira and Emmeline to the ground. Still, Kaisis fell, his spells forever silenced. Meanwhile, Khalid engaged the plate-wearing tank of the attacking band, a man named Ginthorn, proving to be the toughest of the enemy band and a formidable adversary. Delivering powerful blows, Khalid found himself on the brink of defeat, but just as it seemed Khalid might fall, his wife Jahira rose from her injuries and chanted the proper healing incantations, her magic mending his wounds to keep him in the fight. Abdel took note that Jahira and Imowen had taken damage and that Jahira in particular was struggling amid her own injuries to cast spells. Abdel, using his own newfound arcane abilities, first cast blindness upon Ginthorn before resuming his battle with Drasus. As the battle raged on, Drasus became frustrated by Abdel's patient and strong defense. In a moment of vulnerability, Abdel seized opportunity. With a swift and calculated strike, he brought Drasus to his knees ending his reign of leadership. Becoming a regular sight, Abdel having killed Drassus moved with incredible finesse to assist Khalid, his combat prowess shining in the midst of chaos. He too engaged Ginthorn, staggered and recovering from his blindness, and together he and Khalid managed to drop the bulwark of a man once and for all. With the enemy band crumbling, Rizdan wearing the injuries of Emowyn's arrows and the sole remaining member of the group, attempted to retreat, but found himself surrounded. Realizing he had no way out, he spoke through gritted teeth. Do your worst, Ward of Gorion, but you'll get nothing from me. Abdel, with his blade tip pressed against the mage's soft robes, leaned in close and whispered unknown words into the mage's ear. Rezdan's eyes widened in fear, and he relented, revealing the location and access to the secret Cloakwood Mine the very engine of the Iron Crisis. Okay, okay, the only way in or out is through an obscure and plain-looking storehouse next to the barracks. Inside, you'll find a hidden lift that will take you down into the mine shaft. With that vital information obtained, Resdian was left alive but mortally wounded to succumb to his wounds or whatever fate had destined for him. Emowyn, removing the magical boots of speed from Drassus, also found another note adding yet more clues to this sprawling realm-wide riddle in the name of Realtar Anchev, who hired Drassus and appears to be at the top of the Iron Throne organization. The battle had been one of the toughest Abdel's group had faced thus far, but with determination, strategy, and a bit of luck, they had merged victorious, one step closer to unraveling the mysteries that lay before them. Abdel and company continued their march forward, eventually locating the hidden entrance to the mine, just as Resden had revealed. They cautiously descend, taking note that the working miners are human men, enslaved by whatever evil is in charge. They freed these men as they proceeded downward, with the same name being mentioned over and over, a hated and sinister mage named Daveorn. Any initial hopes Abdel had of a silent path down to the base of the mine were shattered when a group of nine goblin-like creatures patrolling the miners discover and attack the party, surely alerting those beyond of their arrival. Khalid confirmed these were known as the Tazloi as they engaged the vile creatures, but they offered little resistance to this group growing of prowess and renown. As they reach the base of operation at the mine's bottom, they enter a darkened chamber where they are met with a terrifying sight, realizing they have entered a shrine to something truly evil. The walls are adorned with gruesome tapestries depicting acts of violence and murder dominated by blood-red hues as sinister candles cast eerie, flickering shadows that dance across the room's slick stone surfaces. At the center of the room stands a chilling altar dedicated to Baal. This, a chamber of horrors that makes Mullahay's unholy shrine in Nashkel seem positively pious, is adorned with grotesque offerings, a collection of severed limbs and organs preserved in a gruesome display of devotion to the god of murder. The air is heavy with the acrid scent of incense, mingling with the metallic tang of dried blood. 
Dark symbols and runes etched upon the floor seem to writhe and pulse with malevolent energy. They bear witness to the vile rituals that have taken place here in the name of Baal. The room's unsettling ambiance shakes the young heroes as their eyes adjust to the robed figure standing at the altar before them. In the name of Baal, the intrepid adventurers have found their way to my lair after all. Why have you come? Vengeance for an old sage? Perhaps you seek to righteously punish me for my affront to your morality. It matters little, for you will do neither. Before you die a horrible death in the name of the Lord of Murder, perhaps I should introduce myself. I am Daviorn. I would ask your companions their names, but I care little to become acquainted with the dead. Abdel begins to charge forward, but in an instant, the mage vanishes. Does everyone have a ring of invisibility but me? Abdel thought to himself. Khalid, a veteran of battle tactics, scanned the room, informing the group that the mage had used some form of teleport, perhaps Dimension Door. This teleportation was making it nearly impossible for Abdel or Khalid to land their blades upon the elusive mage, but Daviorn's cunning tactics didn't end there. First using a protection spell that repelled Emowyn's arrows, then employing Mirror Image, creating multiple illusory duplicates of himself, forcing the heroes to waste precious attacks on illusions while the true Daviorn plotted his next move, further bewildering the brave party. Summoning dark forces, Daviorn then called forth two battle horrors, evil animated suits of plate armor, each a formidable adversary in its own right. The metallic giants advanced upon the party, clashing with Abdel and Khalid, their massive fists striking with bone-crushing force. As if this wasn't enough, Daviorn continued to hurl spells with deadly precision. Fireballs erupted in the chamber, searing the air and scorching the very ground beneath the adventurer's feet, while lightning bolts cracked through the air, arcing towards their targets with uncanny accuracy. The battle was fierce and relentless. Once again, Abdel, Emowyn, Jahira, and Khalid all found themselves pushed to their limits, wounds piled up, and it seemed as though victory might slip through their grasp. Jahira, casting healing spells upon her comrades as quickly as she could speak the incantations, was growing weak. But in the face of despair, the group's resilience and whatever unknown force was driving Abdel showed their true value. While Jahira's druidic magic mended their wounds, Emowyn's quick reflexes allowed her to distract the mage's concentration as Khalid coordinated their attacks in order to finally corner the mage. In a climactic culmination of this heated battle, Emowyn would later swear she saw Abdel's eyes begin to glow as he once again entered his trance-like state. But this time, it was different. Abdel was fully consumed and moved with supernatural speed and finesse, reaching the alacritous mage amid his duplicitous images, his mighty blade striking true and landing a decisive blow that sent the evil mage reeling, a shock revealed in his fearful eyes. Before the mage had even a moment to recover or consider his next action, Abdel struck again in a fluid dance-like rhythm, plunging his blade deep into the neck of the unholy necromancer. Daviorn, the powerfully evil mage and disciple to the god of murder Baal, fell against his own profane altar, bloody and utterly vanquished, his form becoming just another gruesome trophy displayed upon his grotesque shrine. As the group took a moment to recover and reflect, having survived the truest test of their courage and skill yet, Abdel searched the room feverishly for clues. Among Daviorn's possessions, Abdel found an arcane key, and three letters providing ample clues on how to proceed forward. The first letter described the villainous chain of command at work, with the Black Talons mercenary company being run by the bandit Lord Tazok. The ogre himself reported to the now dearly departed Daveorn, who in turn answers directly to a member of the Iron Throne, Realtar Anchev. The note further describes an unmarked former noble estate that now serves as the Iron Throne's hidden headquarters in Baldur's Gate. The second letter again mentions Saravok, named as being a member of the Iron Throne, placed in command of the region. And the final third letter, heavily implicating the Iron Throne as orchestrating the Iron Crisis in full by creating iron shortages, tainting exports, and stockpiling their own supplies, as well as creating rumors to deflect their own culpability thus implicating another mercenary company, the Zintarim, 
as the source of the conspiracy. Having now eliminated the immediate threats of Mullahay and Daviorn, and with the escaped Tazak's operation exposed, Abdel and his loyal companions set out for Baldur's Gate, seeking the root of the Iron Throne's sinister machinations, but not before locating an enslaved miner named Rill to help free and evacuate all of the miners. Once evacuated, the arcane key found on Daviorn is used to flood the mine, further crippling the Iron Throne. The great city of Baldur's Gate was rife with unease upon their arrival. Plagued by iron shortages and rising crime, the Iron Throne had embedded itself into every level of society. Common folks and nobles alike seemed enthralled to their influence. Gaining audience with the Flaming Fist, the group is introduced to a man named Herbal Duthkapka, better known to most as Scar, a gruff captain of the mercenary policing force of Baldur's Gate. Scar has heard the reports of the group's activities and supports Abdel's suspicions. After assisting Scar investigate the Seven Sons Trading Company and learning that doppelgangers are present in the city, Abdel and his crew gain an audience with Duke Elton of the city's ruling elite and member of the famed Council of Four. Abdel relays his discoveries of the Iron Throne's broad ambitions to profit from conflict spreading chaos to net influence and perhaps more unknown and sinister intents. Looking at what circumstantial evidence the party has, the Duke agrees that something afoul was afoot, but states that more evidence is needed. That night, with the unofficial blessing of both Scar and Duke Elton, Abdel and Emowyn infiltrated the Iron Throne's local headquarters following the information found in Daviorn's notes. The pair slipped silent and unseen and reaching the inner offices. Silently ransacking the place for information, Emowyn finds evidence that Saravok is in fact the son of Realtar Anchev, and that they are scheming to depose of the city's council in order to install Saravok as ruler of Baldur's Gate. Continuing their search, the pair finds notes confirming an upcoming secret gathering scheduled within Candlekeep's walls to be attended by Saravok and key Iron Throne leaders. The next morning, the group shared their findings with Duke Elton, who was now fully convinced of this sinister plot, but still required solid proof of Saravok's complicity. He agreed that the promising group of heroes should continue their search in Candlekeep and offered to teleport them near the fortress archive. Abdel and Imwen realized that a return home was ahead, but under far different circumstances. Abdel, knowing all too well of both the magical wards that protected the venerable Fortress of Knowledge, as well as their strict rules on entry, was at a loss on how to gain access to his childhood home. Luckily, Duke Elton had the answer in the form of a rare tome he possessed called The History of the Nether Scrolls, a book of ancient undeciphered text that according to Candlekeep's own rules of entry would surely grant them passage. The thought of returning to his childhood sanctuary and all the memories it would ignite sparked Abdel's nerves, a mixture of excitement and ominous dread washed over him for reasons he could not quite place. Nonetheless, the die was set and Abdel knew he must return. Upon arrival, and with the offering of Duke Elton's rare tome to the keeper of the portal, Abdel once again graced the halls of the greatest knowledge archive in all Faerun. Inside, Abdel senses that while much is familiar, something also seems amiss in his childhood home. Emowyn too has a similar strange feeling, suggesting though that a lot has happened to this year. Regardless, Abdel warns the group to be mindful and alert. Arriving well before the scheduled start of this covert meeting, each member of the group had some personal time to pursue other objectives. While Emowyn went to catch up with old friends, Chahira took the time to meditate with Khalid in tow as those two were near inseparable. Abdel consumed with questions that still lacked answers regarding Gorion's death, his heritage, and the many clues found involving the dead god Baal decided to visit the archives. On his way to the great library, Abdel is met by his old tutor, a candlekeep monk named Pieto that Abdel was very fond of. Pleased to see Abdel, yet saddened, of course, by the loss of Gorion, 
Pietro gives Abdel a look, almost as if he is worried others might be listening, and then speaks. Abdel, oh my boy, I pine for the days when you and Gorion still called Candlekeep home. You always brought a bit of energy to these walls. Uh, can't really talk now. I shall have to speak with you later at length. But for now you must rest. Yes, you should definitely head to Gorion's old room. It is just as it ever was. And Abdel, be sure to have a good look around, won't you? After the knowing glance from his old tutor, Abdel gives Pieto a warm farewell and proceeds down the south corridor to his adoptive father's old chamber. Abdel fights back the flood of emotion as he enters Gorion's quarters. Have a look around, Pieto said. Remembering fondly his ten plus years here, Abdel smiled warmly as he recalled a few secret areas in Gorion's room, all the sneaking and spying with Emma and his children finally paying off. It was there he found his adoptive father's stash of ancient scrolls, and among them, lying on top, was a lengthy note. Abdel, my son, if you are reading this, I have met my untimely death. I would tell you not to grieve for me, but in truth I feel much better thinking that you would. There are things I must tell you in this letter that I might have already shared. However, if my death came too soon, then I would have never been given the chance, so I write this, hoping it finds its way to your hands. As you know, I am not your biological father, for that distinction lies with another. Please know I kept this truth from you for the noblest of reasons. In my hope of keeping you safe from harm and giving you a normal childhood, knowing your adulthood would be anything but. Abdel, you are the offspring of the deity and divine evil named Ball. This note contains all I know. In an era known to history as the Time of Troubles, the gods were made to walk among Faerun in their own mortal shells. Ball had been forewarned of the death that awaited him during this time of his own vulnerability. For his own sinister and selfish reasons, Ball sought mortal women of every race across the realm in order to procreate a multitude of his progeny. Your mother, Aliana, was one of those women, and as you know, she died in childbirth. What you may not know is that Aliana and I had been in love at one time before she had fallen to evil. After her encounter with this evil divine, your mother became a priestess who served at the Temple of Ball in the Forest of Worms. I, on the other hand, served with the good and just Harpers, while I could not abide by her evil ways, I always loved her, and to this very day chose to believe she had been corrupted into her choices. After her death, I had the absolute obligation to shield and protect you from that path, to raise you as my own. I have always thought of you as my child, and I hope you still think of me as your father. If you make use of our library, you will find that our founder, Alondo the Wise, has many prophecies concerning the coming of the spawn of Ball. But know this, my dear boy. You are special. The blood of the gods runs through your veins. Son, there are many who will want to use or destroy you for their own evil purposes. One of them is a man who calls himself Saravok. I suspect he is, like you, a seed and spawn of Ball. He has studied here at Candlekeep and thus knows a great deal about your history and who you are. I fear your life is in danger to Saravok and any that follow him. Be righteous, my son. Do not fall to evil. Your divine mandate is not set, so choose your own path, for both greatness and dangers lie ahead for you. Your father, Gorion. On his way back to the group while reeling from these revelations, a stranger named Hovaras approached. He claimed Gorion had entrusted him with a ring to pass on to Abdel after his death. Abdel, still lost in Gorion's words, absently took the ring from the stranger and began flipping it about, childlike in his hand, emotions still flooding his mind as he contemplated all that had transpired this year. While doing so, he noticed, almost bemused, that the ring actually had the stranger's name on the inside, Kovaros. He must be mistaken. Abdel was just about to politely inform the stranger of his mistake when, now perhaps it was an unseen force guiding him, or maybe it was the mere coincidence of his mundane act of playful flips, 
that caused the ring to fall from his hand and onto the ground. At the exact moment that the cloaked stranger lunged at Abdel with a ghostly blade of sinister power, the lethal strike missing Abdel just as his friends rushed toward the mysterious man. The cloaked figure, missing his opportunity, simply grinned, and just before vanishing by some powerful magic said to Abdel, Soon, brother. A confused Abdel, his head spinning from the calamitous events of just the past hours, bent over to grab the stranger's ring. It was at that very moment when every piece snapped into place. The note, the ring, the name Hovaras written on the inside, now staring back at him, backwards, reading Saravak. Saravak, soon brother, the prophecy, until but one remains. Abdel turned to his friends, but before he could utter a word, alarms blared and candlekeep guards and protector monks quickly surrounded the four friends. Ulrant, keeper of the tomes and an arrogant wizard who Abdel often called the old buzzard, walked up to the accosted friends, informing them that the Iron Throne delegation was just found murdered. Abdel and his companions were arrested and imprisoned at the keep's barracks, Ulrant formally charging Abdel with murder and stating they would be transferred to Baldur's Gate in the morning where they would be tried and executed. Emerging to his senses, Abdel knew they must get to Baldur's Gate to see Scar and Duke Elton, but not at the end of a rope. But first, they had to escape these barracks. Hours later, the sage Teth Toril, a longtime friend of Gorion, arrived late in the evening after gathering news out of Baldur's Gate that Abdel and his companions were to be hanged. The sage, believing in Abdel's innocence, offers to help the heroes escape Candlekeep and warns that they are wanted, so take caution. Tethyril's magic will free the group from their cells, but magic wards prevent teleportation to outside of the keep. However, the mage was able to portal the heroes to the lower catacombs where they can exit the keep to the east. In these dungeon passages, Abdel and his friends were beset upon by the same doppelgangers that they encountered in Baldur's Gate, taking on familiar faces such as Elminster and even Gorion, leaving them to wonder who in the keep was real and who was not. With no time to do anything but make haste to Baldur's Gate, they regrouped outside the keep, free from its strong magical wards. Abdel considered the prophecy's meaning. Tethtoril gave no clues, but implored Abdel to stop Saravok by any means. The mage wished them luck as he proceeds to teleport the heroes just outside of Baldur's Gate. The brave young heroes, now wanted for murders they did not commit, arrive in Baldur's Gate disguised in hooded cloaks to avoid unwanted eyes. Knowing that they were now wanted, the heroes took no chances, seeking quiet investigation and information gathering before making their moves. Milling around the shadowed corners of various taverns and quiet investigation on the city streets, it was not long before they secured a trusted lay of the land. Khalid and Jahira's reputation as harpers paying off as they find a fellow harper named Delphir in front of the renowned wizard shop known as Sorceress Sundries. Delphir shares the grave news that had transpired in the city since their last visit and answers all of their questions. Through this interaction, they learn that Scar, the contact and commander of the Flaming Fist, has been killed, and that a corrupt officer named Angelo Dosen, a puppet to the Iron Throne, has been installed as the head of the organization. Further, Delphir informs the party that Duke Elton has taken deathly ill, he shares the insidious rumors swirling around the Duke's personal healer, Rashad, that the group might want to investigate. Unfortunately, that means the Flaming Fist headquarters will need to be infiltrated. Abdel decides the best course of action would be to attempt to reach Elton by himself so as to not attract any unwanted attention. Delthir and Abdel's friends are instructed to wait at the three old kegs for his return. Abdel is able to reach the upstairs of the Flaming Fist headquarters without alarm, where he is spotted by a Flaming Fist officer. As Abdel prepares to silence the man, the officer first addresses Abdel with a look of clear recognition. Lower your weapon. I am no threat to you. My name is Kent. I remember you from when you worked for Scar and Duke Elton. Well, since you've been gone, 
I fear corruption has taken over the city. Elton's taken very ill. He's resting in the room beside us. But I have suspicions about his healer, Rashad. He keeps saying that there's nothing to be done, but I know better, and he's no healer from what I've seen. Anyhow, it don't matter. I've decided to leave the Flaming Fist. There is a lot of corruption at play and I don't want to lose my life over whatever power struggle is going on around here. Abdel nods, thanking Kent for the information, and asks him to wait while he checks on Elton. The large chamber of Duke Elton was dimly lit and a heavy air of illness hung over the room. Entering cautiously, concern etched on Abdel's face as he looked upon the gravely ill Duke even from a distance. Duke Elton's personal healer, Rashad, unaware of Abdel's entry, was hunched over the Duke and seemed to have just covertly placed a few drops of liquid from a small vial upon the Duke's sleeping lips. Suspicion and rage gnawed at Abdel as he watched Rashad's actions. The once formidable leader now lay weak and frail, his labored breathing evidence of his deteriorating condition. Abdel addresses Rashad sternly, asking the nature of the vial, his voice cutting through the silence of the chamber. Startled, Rashad turns to face Abdel, his expression a mixture of surprise and guilt. Trying to maintain his composure, he replies that he was merely administering a tonic to aid in the Duke's recovery. Telling Abdel that the Duke now requires rest and healing in an attempt to exit the room, but Abdel's instincts mirror that of Kent's, Something was wrong, and he pressed further, demanding to see the vial. The facade crumbling as he realized he was caught. Without a word, Rashad transformed before Abdel's eyes, revealing his true form, a greater doppelganger, the shape-shifting creature known for its deception. In an instant, the doppelganger lunged at Abdel, its claws extended and eyes filled with malice. The battle that ensued was fierce, but Abdel was well prepared. With a final, well-placed strike, the doppelganger fell, crumbling to the ground in death. Abdel turned his attention to Duke Elton, who was now awake and very weak, but alive. The Duke managed a faint smile and thanked Abdel for saving his life. Elton knew he was not safe in his current location, even with Rashad dead. Weak and unable to move on his own, he confided in Abdel that the only place he could recover was at the Harbor Masters, who was both an ally and could provide protection while he healed. Abdel nodded, determined to get the Duke to safety. Bringing Kent into the chamber, he informed Elton that Kent's assistance helped save him. With the mercenaries' help, they quietly and carefully moved the weakened Duke onto a covered cart in the rear of the building, doing their best to avoid the prying eyes of the Flaming Fist guards who patrolled the area. They navigated the lesser-walked paths of Baldur's Gate to arrive at the Harbor Master's location. Abdel himself surprised, they reached the Harbor Master's sanctuary unscathed. Duke Elton, now in the Harbor Master's care, expressed his gratitude once again to Abdel. With a trembling hand, he handed over a note, further shedding light on the forces at play in Baldur's Gate. Elton's final words before passing out were, Save Lila and Belt. Quickly returning to the three old kegs, Abdel shared the information contained in the note Elton had passed. It was written by Saravok to someone named Kiska, and it was the last of the pieces to fall into place, confirming that Grand Duchess Lila Janeth and Grand Duke Belt were to be killed by two assassins, Kristen and Slythe, after which Saravok would be the sole ruler of Baldur's Gate, followed by a declaration of war on Alm. Taking this information with all that he had learned about his own heritage, Abdel knew that guided by the prophecy, Saravak would use the chaos and bloodshed of that war to ascend to godhood, the rebirth of the god of murder. Abdel's mind raced with the implications. Acting with urgency to stop these assassinations, the group sought access to the deep dark underground of Baldur's Gate. Delthir, wishing to assist, informs the party he knows a way. Guided by Delthir, they navigate through the twisted and narrow streets, seeking the hidden catacombs known as the Undercellar. Delthir's knowledge of the city's hidden passages proved invaluable as he led the way. Their journey brought them to a secluded shrine dedicated to the god of suffering, Ilmater. In the dim light of the early evening, Delthir revealed a concealed passage that led deeper into the city's underbelly. The air grew damp and oppressive as they descended, the very atmosphere echoing the grim nature of their mission. Several hours into their exploration of the city's hidden murky depths, 
Abdel knew they were close in this cat and mouse game, feeling several times the assassins were near, only to slip away. Then, in a dimly lit corridor, they encountered Sly, but one of the assassins they sought. Abdel's instincts told him that something was amiss, for Kristen, Sly's spouse and partner in crime, was conspicuously absent. Sly attacked first as the battle began with a flurry of steel and spells. Unseen until she struck with deadly precision, Kristen's dagger aimed at the unsuspecting Delthir. With a swift and brutal backstab, the assassin was revealed. Just as Delthir fell, his life extinguished in an instant. The party fought valiantly, the loss of Delthir weighing heavily on their hearts. They managed to silence the assassins, but the battle had taken its toll. As they searched the lifeless body of Slythe, Emmeline discovered a crumpled piece of parchment. There was an invitation, adorned with the ominous seal of Saravok. The contents revealed his coronation was imminent. Amidst the towering spires of Baldur's Gate, the air was thick with tension as the Ducal Palace's grand doors creaked open. Inside, a sea of the city's most prestigious nobles were congregated, their whispers echoing through the Grand Hall. With the coronation of Saravok just moments away, the fate of the city hung in the balance. Saravok, the soon-to-be head of the Council of Four, took to the podium, his voice dripping with lies and deceit. He wove his tales of the Zintarim's treachery, painting them as the architects of the Iron Crisis and urging for a preemptive strike against Am. But amidst the throng of noblemen, a determined figure emerged. Abdel, armed with a mountain of irrefutable evidence, challenged the proceedings. A man wholly transformed since the day he fled Candlekeep, his form now stood strong and heroic, his voice booming loud like thunder as he unveiled the dark tapestry of Saravok's schemes. The manufactured Iron Crisis, plots of war, the cold-blooded murder of Gorion, Scar, and even his own father, Realtar the sinister attempts on each duke and duchess on the Council of Four, and, of course, the prophecy. Duke Belt, sensing the gravity of these revelations, agreed to review the evidence. Saravok protested mightily, but his laments were made in vain. The accusations would be heard and reviewed. As Saravok's plan began to unravel, his cloak of lies and charm dropped, making his ambitions chillingly clear. The very floor seemed to tremble beneath as the gathered nobles in a horrifying revelation transformed into greater doppelgangers. Pandemonium erupting as Saravok and his malevolent mentor, Winsky Perorate, vanished in an arcane torrent, and Abdel knew of only one place they would go. With a wellspring of rage building within him, Abdel left his heroic friends to protect the dukes and vanquish the doppelgangers as he pursued Saravok under the streets. Destiny would decide two fates this day. The tunnels under Baldur's Gate were ancient and maze-like, but Abdel could feel the dark energy pulsing within him like a beacon, drawing him towards the evil radiating from Saravok. Rounding a corner and in full stride, Abdel nearly collided into Tazok, the bandit ogre leader. Tazok roared in rage, looking for his revenge, and began to unsheath his greatsword. But the fully consumed Abdel, barely acknowledging the ogre's presence, leapt into the air to silence and slice the ogre's throat mid-roar. Tazek barely had time to realize his own end as his thick neck was nearly severed from his body, the ogre's head falling to the side as his body went limp. Abdel did not even look back as he charged forward into Saravok's underground temple. For the third time now, Abdel made his way into an unholy and profane temple of pure wickedness. At the far end loomed Saravok before a statue of the corpse lord Baal himself. Saravok roared with a knowing look and drawing a massive black sword glowing with some dark power, the black spikes of his armored and ominous form now in full display, reminding Abdel of the night he first encountered and fled Saravok. The night his father died. He would not flee this night. Abdel now knew Saravok had manipulated events all along to goad and prepare Abdel for this very moment, an orchestrated end when one would defeat the other an inch closer to inheriting their father's dread legacy. In this dimly lit, 
ancient temple of evil, the clash of two destinies began. Abdel hurled bolts of magic towards Saravok, seeking to weaken the advancing Hulk, yet to his dismay, Saravok shrugged off an arcane onslaught that seemed to have little or no effect, his dark armor shimmering with an unholy resilience. With a powerful advance, Saravok closed the gap, his great sword swinging like a juggernaut in wide, furious arcs. Abdel barely had time to react. He parried Saravok's mighty blows, but the sheer force behind each strike sent tremors of pain through his body. After agonizing minutes of struggle back and forth, Saravok's powerful blows began to wear down the smaller opponent. Truly surprised by his strength, a glancing blow from Saravok's great sword finally managed to break Abdel's weary defenses, staggering the now injured hero. In that moment of desperation, the divine power of his ancient legacy coursing through Abdel's veins surged forth. His eyes glazed over as he entered the now familiar trance-like state, tapping into the reservoir of power within him. This newfound energy revitalized his abilities, lending an otherworldly swiftness and strength to his strikes. Now on even footing, it seemed, as Saravok's onslaught came, time seemed to slow for Abdel. Instead of resisting directly, Abdel parried lightly and gave ground, turning his brother's rage and power against him. Within minutes, Saravok was winded, cursing Abdel's defensive tactics as cowardice. The tides of battle beginning to turn, with each swing of his blade, Abdel's attacks now wore down Saravok. He noticed that with every cut into Saravok's blackened armor, a strange, ethereal gold essence mixed with the dripping blood from his wounds. It was a mysterious dark power that both terrified Abdel yet also felt familiar. Finally, in a climactic moment, Saravok, his strength waning, knocked Abdel to the temple floor once again. Seizing upon this opportunity, Saravok raised his mighty sword to deliver the finishing blow. But Abdel, now empowered by his own destiny, struck with supernatural quickness. In the blink of an eye, Abdel ran his sword through the black heart of Saravok. With a gasp of disbelief, Saravok sank to his knees, crimson lifeblood and ethereal essence gushing down his blackened armor. The malevolent ball spawn looked on in disbelief. This was not the fate he had envisioned for himself. Abdel, exhausted, looked down upon his fallen half-brother, contemplating the possibility that he was now the last of the ball spawn. But as Saravok's lifeless form crumpled to the cold temple floor, Abdel's vision began to dim, the shadows deepening around his periphery. Abdel, caught in a fugue-like trance, found himself adrift in an ethereal realm, his senses overwhelmed by the echoing whispers of Eon's past. There he followed Saravok's essence, the swirling maelstrom of the divine and the dark. Escaping from Saravok's corporeal form, Abdel's vision followed its journey through the shimmering veils of reality, arriving at an awe-inspiring temple. This sanctum, vast and circular, rose to dizzying heights. Its walls were lined with countless statues of the dead god Baal, each meticulously crafted and each eerily identical, standing sentinel in silent anticipation of a dark resurrection, a rebirth. Drawn irresistibly to one statue, Saravok's essence collided with it, causing the monolith to crack and crumble. But as it shattered, the magnitude of what remained became hauntingly clear to Abdel. An endless expanse of identical statues, untouched, yet waiting. A chilling realization, hinting that Abdel may not be the last of the ball spawn, and that countless others might yet tread the paths of the mortal realm, each bearing the dark legacy of the god of murder. Moments later, his conscience restored. He knew now his dark heritage, and he trembled at the latent power that seethed within and guided his actions this past year, a power he had been able to control, but for how long? What sinister intentions lie ahead? A dark path, a path he was compelled, perhaps destined to walk, but towards what end he could not guess. By fate or destiny, he had proven worthy of inheriting his accursed father's mantle, and with the friendship and love of his friends, 
he was determined to refute the ancient prophecy, his destiny. The child of Baal had just taken the first step into the long dark. And that concludes the story and my own personal experiences with Baldur's Gate 1, a truly groundbreaking game. Its ripple effect impacting both video and tabletop gaming for years to come. If you'd like to see more of these long form stories across all of the Forgotten Realms and even the Outer Plains, please let me know. And if you're new to the channel and like what you saw, maybe consider liking and subscribing. And if you're a regular around here and you haven't yet subbed, why not? Maybe tell me where I can improve to earn that sub. Thanks for listening. And until next time, remember, the only limitation at your table is your imagination.